Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and a, a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers, <coughs> um, business school and Dawn Center advisory board members, alumni, fellows of the Dawn Center, and to the faculty, students, administrators, and guests who are here with us today. We're delighted to have you with us and thank you all for taking time out of your schedule today to join us for the panel on managing risk to enable supply chain agility and resilience. I'd like to um, give a huge thank you to the whole Adelphi team for making this possible. Uh, my name is Gita Suri. I'm Associate Dean in the School of Business. And before we begin, I'd like to give you the agenda for the session and make a few housekeeping announcements. We'll begin with some remarks from Dean Mary, Dr. Marianne Highland. Uh, this will be followed by a brief introduction to the Dawn Center by me. Uh, Ms. Daniela Zuldas Pekova will introduce our panelists, our distinguished speakers today. Uh, I will be the moderator for the session. After the panel discussion, there will be a question and answer session with the audience led by graduate assistant Tiger Shui. Uh, please write your questions in the chat area and we'll take them up one by one. Uh, I'll also wrap up the session and give a word of thanks. So please keep your microphone on mute unless you're speaking. If you have any questions during the panel, we'd like to ask you to please type the questions in the chat. Uh, they'll be logged and we'll address them at the end of the discussion during the question and answer session. I'd now like to call upon Dr. Marianne Highland, Dean of the Business School, to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Sori, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening to anyone who may be joining us from outside of the uh, New York area. As you just heard, Dr. Gita Suri is now the Associate Dean for the Business School. We're delighted to have her in this role and look forward to her leadership within the Business School. Given all of her new re responsibilities, um, you may have seen in an email announcement that Dr. Suri will no longer be Director of the Don Center. We are extremely grateful and fortunate to have Dr. Unji Lim, who is the center's new director, and Dr. Zimin Huang, who is the center's new associate director, um, taking over the center's leadership. Gita leaves the Don Center in very capable hands, and we're looking forward to the continued strong programming and other initiatives um, throughout the year. Another change is that Steve Davey, who you may know from his work with the Dawn Center last year, has completed his term as executive in residence, but is continuing to remain on the board for the center. I believe I saw Steve on the call. Thank you, Steve, for all of your past work and continued service to the Dawn Center. Thank you. I'm always impressed by Dawn Center events. Um, managing risk with regard to supply chain management is an extremely timely topic. Part of the business school's mission statement is about preparing our students to be resilient leaders. So having an understanding of how to make a business more agile and resilient is so important in today's uncertain environment. So thank you to all of our speakers. And um, I will turn it back over to uh, Dr. Suri. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Highland. Um, I'm delighted that um, Professors Unji Lim and Zimin Huang are uh, now the uh, director and associate director of the Dawn Center. And I'm looking, look forward to more wonderful programming from them. I'm sure they will take it to the next level. Uh, I'd like to give you some background on the Dawn Center. Uh, the Dawn Center was started by the late Dr. Alan Ashley with funding from Mr. Alan Dawn. Who, who was apparently a faculty member in the business school. The center began with the aim of promoting research and curriculum development in decision sciences and technological innovation through cutting edge events such as the one we have today. It evolved to emphasize collaborating with industry in innovation related areas. These include innovations in supply chain and data analytics to support the curriculum in our master's programs in supply chain management and data analytics. Collaborations include student products, uh, projects on industry-related problems and research projects to solve challenges faced by companies. Through such collaborations and events such as panel discussions, workshops, and conferences, the Dawn Center aims to become a knowledge hub and a bridge between academia and industry, and also to enable our students to become industry ready. I'd now like to ask Ms. Daniela zuldas Pekova to introduce the panelists. She is currently a senior finance major and computer science minor student at the School of Business and Adelphi's Honors College. 
She's a part of the Willemstad Leadership Scholars Program this year and is the president of the Apex AU Supply Chain Management Organization on campus. Daniela? Thank you, Dean Suri. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at this amazing event. We have a number of great panelists on the call today, including Mr. Thomas Sproth, Mr. Duncan Kled, and Professor Yoon Ji Lim. Starting with Mr. Sproth, he's a senior director of network development at Trade Lens. He has a varied background in the industry, <coughs> as an officer on merchant vessels, worked on terminals, managed operations, as well as spent a significant amount of time on the commercial side. Most recently, Mr. Sproud was president of Staff Marine with end-to-end -end responsibility for sales and service. Welcome, Mr. Sproud. Next, Thanks. we have Mr. Klett, uh, who is a co-founder and fellow at Canaxis. Since co-founding Canaxis in 1984, Mr. Klett has focused on product innovation and matching rapid response functionality to customer needs. Mr. Kled draws on almost 40 years of experience with analytics and software solutions to design next generation Canaxis product features to help companies balance their supply and demand of everything to drive a greater competitive advantage. Prior to starting at Canaxis, Mr. Kled held various positions with Bell Northern Research and Mattel Corporation. He holds a Bachelor of Applied Science and a Master of Applied Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He's also a certified professional engineer and at Canaxis Certified Rapid Response Master. Welcome, Mr. Clark. Last but most certainly not least, we have Professor Lim, who is an assistant professor of decision sciences and marketing at Adolfo University. Professor Lim received a PhD in management science and engineering from Stanford University in 2008. She worked as an assistant professor of industrial engineering at the University of Miami and as an assistant prof professor in the School of Business at Keene University. In 2018, she joined the faculty of the Department of Decision Sciences and Marketing at Adelphi University as an assistant professor. Uh, since she began her career in academia, she has conducted research in simulation-based decision-making and simulation-based optimization and has published numerous, numerous papers in leading journals. Welcome, Professor Lim. And welcome to everyone once again, and we're very happy to have you on this call today. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, so let's start our topic today, as we as we noted before, is managing risk to enable supply chain agility and resilience. This is certainly not the first event we've had on supply chain. We've had them a couple of for a couple of semesters so far. And um, we are aware, everyone is aware that for the past two years or so, the global pandemic has disrupted supply chains. Of course, we've had that exacerbated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So geopolitical instability or conflict has further disrupted supply chains, especially in a variety of industries such as agricultural uh, industries, chemical manufacturing, metals, oil and gas um, industries. And as many effects are still rippling through supply chains, there may be long lasting problems developing before the, uh, below the surface for supply chain operators. So these could include things like the unavailability of critical inputs that can shut down products and revenues or depletion of, or, may, or uh, deplete safety stocks or exports. And um, even demand supply chains are likely to be affect, affected by the emphasis in Europe on securing food, energy, and critical materials. These factors together with a continued focus on sustainability may require different supply chain management strategies, including ways to monitor potential sources of disruption and finding alternative sources of supply to enable agility and resilience in the supply chain. So let me start by asking uh, just some basic questions and we will move on to um, uh, more complicated ones. So, um, what are some of the challenges uh, companies are facing in the area of supply chain agility? And what are some examples of companies with uh, agile supply chains? I'm gonna start by asking each of you in turn, and then sometimes I may skip uh, one or two of you in uh, one of you in the, in the uh, uh, conversation and we'll ask a different question. So maybe Tom, you would like to take the first one? Sure, thank you very much. Um... So yeah, seemingly, you know, any cocktail party I go to, 
people say the reason something hasn't happened is supply chain, which really gets to me because I'm in the supply chain. But actually, you see how supply chain has gone from you know something that was managed within a department and a company to now being a board boardroom discussion about where our products are, how do we get them on the shelves? So the key word you used is agility um, because we went very quickly from just in time supply chains, making sure they, there wasn't too much inventory in the supply chain, reducing costs to uh, seemingly every geopolitical event was causing disruption in the supply chain, um, physical events and pol political events um, to where inventory has gone to just in case levels of supply. Uh, so now they have to have extra in case something else goes wrong. Um, so they're over ordering. And very, very recently, we're seeing a reversal of that, um, mm -hmm. partly due to calendar events in terms of uh, now you see Walmart, Target, and others starting to reduce their inventory levels. So little hint, if you're buying Christmas gifts, you ought to buy them early because the supply is not going to be there uh, later in the year. Um, so you, you can see in the, over the course of the past uh, 18 to 24 months, it's gone from normalization just in time to, oh my gosh, just in case, to now we have too much, we better start to whittle it down. Um, so you can see the supply, supply chain is um, not only become a boardroom issue, but it's it's a personal issue. So for all of us, when we go shopping, something is not there that we're typically used to seeing. So it's it's really become very, very dynamic. Okay, Duncan? Yeah, thanks, Gita and Tom. So yeah, it's an interesting world for sure. Uh, supply chains were mostly working pretty well before COVID, but even then the tariffs in China were starting to cause some disruptions. And um, what Tom described and what we've all seen uh, post COVID is really a classic bullwhip where uh, people made decisions, they overreacted to the, to the change. And so they ran out, they, or they didn't act fast enough at the beginning. So they ran out and then they overreacted. And so then they had too much and now they're trying to cut that back. And I suspect there's a few more uh, ups and downs in that yet before we're done. And who knows what the disrupt the next disruption will, will going to be will, will be. Um, I was going to mention also like agility and resilience. So resilience is the ability, if you like, to survive a change, and agility is one of the methods of surviving that change. So you can get a lot of resilience by just having a whole lot of inventory. You might go bankrupt because you can't afford it, but you have a lot of resilience. The agility is a method of giving you resilience without having so much uh, inventory or so much uh, uh, resilience, if you want to put it. Well, it gives you resilience without the inventory, I guess, is what agility does. Um, I think that sort of answers the question. So what would you say is the, is the key challenge that you know companies are facing today? Is it the fact that things are changing so rapidly? It's much more of a volatile situation where it's like predicting the weather. You don't know what's going to happen next. Well, supply chains have got incredibly complicated and products have become incredibly complicated. And the market used to be, well, Henry Ford said, I'll sell you any Model T as long as it's black. And now I'm not sure how many um, variants of a Ford 150 there are, but there are a mm -hmm. lot. Uh, and then there's all the other vehicles that they make as well uh, and all the different colors. And so to get that mix of product supply chain is all about getting the right stuff to the right place at the right mm -hmm. time, which seems sort of obvious, but actually achieving that is very complicated, very difficult. Prior to COVID, supply chains were mostly working reasonably well. Certainly the inventories have been squeezed out. So a big focus on just in time, a big focus on lean, which I think people misinterpreted. I actually am a great believer in lean that lean is it's not something that the customer isn't willing to pay for, it's waste. Now, customers are all, have all of a sudden realized they're willing to pay for some assurance of supply. So having extra inventory or having alternative suppliers, which might add cost, is actually not counter to lean. It's actually part of lean because the customer is willing to pay for it in many cases. I probably said enough on that now. <laughs> okay. Um... 
Professor Lim, would you like to add anything here? Uh, sure. Yeah. From a modeling perspective, resilience means flexibility. And flexibility means do we have enough safety stock? Do we have enough extra production capacity? Do we have backup suppliers? Do we have backup carriers? And all these make a supply chain more resilient. So should we, the next question is, should we have flexibility in every part of a supply chain? No, we should have flexibility in the bottleneck operation. Mm -hmm. And uh, right, so the bottleneck operation is very important because when there is disruption, it's the bottleneck operation that limits the capacity of the entire supply chain. The bottleneck operation can be the supplier with the most critical components, or it can be the production line that has the least amount of capacity, or it can be the carrier who makes deliveries in the high traffic area. But mm -hmm. the tricky part is the bottleneck operation is not feasible when things are normal. So we need special tools such as simulation to identify the mm -hmm. bottleneck operation. Mm -hmm. And we can think of a, a, a simulation as a digital twin of a real world supply chain. Mm -hmm. And to create this digital twin, we need, we need to be able to see all the members in a supply chain. So visibility is another critical issue when creating right. such a digital twin. It's interesting. I think uh, I read a report that said something like, Almost half of supply chain, um, you know, uh, 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 executives have some or companies have um, have visibility into the top tier of the supply chain. But when it comes mm -hmm. down to lower tiers, it's very little. Maybe two percent have some mm -hmm. idea of where you know what the location is all about or anything about the suppliers. So I think that getting that visibility is probably very critical. So I, if I could add, Unji, yeah. I think the. Uh, the bottleneck also moves. So uh, I think the Port of LA is, has improved somewhat the last few months. And so maybe it had been definitely a bottleneck. Now, I think it's less so. Um, some components are less of a bottleneck, but then others are more. So it, and that's where your simulation comes in too, is, well, in this situation, this item becomes a bottleneck. In some other situation, something else, something else becomes a bottleneck. Okay. Um, so can you share some examples of companies that, are, that do, uh, you know, have been managing their supply chains well, even under these difficult circumstances? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're asking me? <laughs> yeah, I have, well, Tom or Duncan or yeah. you know, anyone. So I would, uh, so this is how I, so I'm with the container shipping mm -hmm. part of the industry. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see how they've reacted. So the old business axiom, never waste a good crisis. Um, mm -hmm. Companies were having challenges, as Duncan said, about how the shifting of where the bottlenecks were from ports to rails to enough trucks, et cetera, to where they were happy to give the um, container carriers more control over their supply chain. So you see more carriers operating air freight, operating warehouses. Mm -hmm. So to give those customers an end-to-end -end view mm -hmm. and responsibility, kind of one throat to choke in terms of where's the problem? It doesn't matter where it shifted. You're responsible to get my cargo to, to the shelves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of the profits that the carriers made, they've kind of reinvested into broadening the supply chain on behalf of the customers to, mm -hmm. to have that coverage for them. Um, the second part of it is now you see technology coming into play. So Mm -hmm. Visibility used to be a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and what we've seen with uh, blockchain-based platforms like TradeLens that I'm involved in, um, really creating that end-to-end -end visibility, getting data from origin warehouses to destination warehouses. Why is that important? Technology in and of itself doesn't solve many problems, but for a customer who needs to make a decision, we said how dynamic the supply chain is becoming. Now mm -hmm. I need to get it off the rail. I need to get it to this warehouse in Memphis versus going all the way to New York. So they need to know exactly where the cargo is mm -hmm. so they can make real time decisions on what to do with their, their product, what to do with their inventories. 
um, and get the most out of their sales. So I think those two things, we've seen fundamental industry shifts of, you know, parts of the business taking end-to-end -end responsibility for the physical movement, mm -hmm. and then uh, a proliferation of uh, platforms that are able to provide visibility end-to-end. -end. Okay. Yeah, Tom, I think the audience would also be interested in terms of supply chain disruption. Um, cost of a container pre-pandemic, I'll say, uh, say from China to the U.S., and maybe uh, cost of putting an 18-wheeler across the country, something, I think those numbers have changed a lot and you probably have a better feel for them than I do. <laughs> yes, so certainly, you know, I, I think there are a number of uh, indices that are out there. Um, you know, whether it's the Shanghai Container Freight Index or some of the other market apps, um, a lot of the carriers are putting their, their prices online, so it makes it a bit easier to track, but it's gone from, let's say, uh, a number starting with a two, like 2000 to go from Shanghai to LA plus an inland mm -hmm. um, to 6,000 to go from oh. Shanghai, that same move mm -hmm. to very recently coming down to maybe 3000. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not gonna take much of another disruption to blow it over and have the prices go back up because of the kind of limited ability to react. <clears throat> So when, when you're doing your modeling, for example, that, that Yunji mentioned, you know, you, you can model certain scenarios, uh, but you can't model every disruption that could come. And the issue with supply chain is it's very asset heavy. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just say, well, just add more ships. Those take three years to build. You cannot say mm -hmm. add more rail cars. Those take two years to build. So the ability to react is part of the modeling that you have to take into account. You can add more trucks, you can build a warehouse, but it takes time. So usually when <clears throat> when you're in a, a pickle, you're gonna stay in the pickle for a while because mm -hmm. it's difficult to, to find solutions. Okay. Duncan, can you think of any companies that have done a really good job of this, managing this? Yeah, one comes to mind is uh, Procter & Gamble, P&G. Mm -hmm. So they have a number of uh, some production facilities and, of course, a number of warehouses in the Florida and East Coast areas. And hurricanes happen. In fact, I'm in Nova Scotia right now. We had one go through here a couple of days ago. Fortunately, not so much where I was, but anyway. Um, and so P&G did a bunch of analysis and said, okay, if there's a hurricane, what's going to happen? And they did a number of simulations and said, well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen depending on exactly where it is. And as the path of a hurricane becomes more evident, then they start moving things around. So they would line up all their uh, pampers, for example, not where the hurricane is going to be, but right next door. They would empty the warehouse in the hurricane area of things that they don't need. So they'd have more room for the things they do need to bring in as soon as, as it's passed, um, things like that. So, and they basically have a game plan. So when this looks like it's going to happen, we start here and we start doing these things and, and they've simulated all this out and have a pretty good idea of what the best uh, approach to dealing with a particular situation is going to be. Now they can't, or haven't analyzed every possible simulation. I'm sure they had not, or potential event, uh, eventuality. I'm sure they had not thought of a volcano in Iceland knocking out air traffic to between Europe and the States. Um, they probably thought of tsunamis in various parts of the world and impact of that. And of course, torrential rains and flooding and things, but you can't cover everything. <laughs> right. So well, then you need the ability, you still need the ability to react. Yeah. Well, some companies seem to have done a better job of this. Nike, for example, in China and, and you know, other companies in Japan, when they got hit by a tsunami, the first one in 2014, they were really caught fat-footed, but then they recovered the next time around, they did a much better job. So mm -hmm. I think companies also learn from having been in uh, situations like that as to what they should be doing. Uh, so that segues nicely into the next question, which is, if you think about uh, the maturity level for supply chain agility and resilience, if you if if level one level zero is zero capabilities and level one is sort of ad hoc, level two has some maturity, mm -hmm. and level three has advanced functions and takes a risk based approach. Level four is totally proactive. So let's say we have a sliding scale from zero to you know the top. 
Um, can you just can you just sort of uh, talk a little bit about you know the status of your company or your industry and customer and client base and where they where you see them uh, in terms of you know level of maturity and and what they're capable of you know in terms of managing their supply chain for this agility and resilience. So this time we'll start with uh, uh, with Duncan. Oh, okay. I thought we'd go to Yunji. Uh, okay. Um, it depends. Uh, some companies are very good in some areas. Some companies are very good in more areas and some companies are very poor. Uh, some companies are looking for our products to help them get better. Um, that's the whole range. Okay. Uh, Tom? Uh, it's an interesting point, uh, and I agree with Duncan. There, there is a, an entire range there of what people can afford to do in terms of uh, redundancy yeah. and the like. Um, if you think of this from a, a student perspective, so mm -hmm. you're hearing all of this and, and how does it apply to me? You know, one of the things to consider is not just how resilient is this company, but how resilient is the, that industry? Um, and one of the things I think is starting to see a blend of technology and industry needs is you're seeing industries coming together for a common solution. I think that is another level of supply chain resiliency where mm -hmm. no matter what modeling you do, you can perfect that model within the framework of this company. Duncan correctly mentioned in the very beginning that the bottlenecks are, in, are moving all the time. So where there's an industrial solution, an industry solution where many players in the industry get together and say, we're gonna invest in this. And that enables us to scale the solution um, because no matter, how to, no matter how well you build the modeling, it's limited in scope to, mm -hmm. to what you can control. So I think the mm -hmm. ultimate you know, penultimate version of this is something that enables an entire industry to react to the benefit of the customers. Have you seen any industries that have actually banded together like this and created some kind of a solution for all members? Well, just thinking of the supply chain itself, I think where there was regulatory approvals, like the rail industry, they're able to share assets, they're able to, hmm. to react that way. However, there's a lot more they can do from a data sharing perspective to be able to react faster. I think carriers are investing in solutions, technology solutions that enable them to offer their customers kind of one one version of, of the truth on, in, in regards to visibility. Um, but others are quite desperate, like warehouses. You know, they're not connected. They're just mm -hmm. companies build them and then we don't, they don't need them. They you know, they really underutilize assets. So, uh, so, so would you say it's the larger companies that are, you know, better off in terms of, or the the ones that are sort of moving on in terms of digital transformation that are better able to react? They are simply because they have scale. So, if you have mm -hmm. scale, you can, you know, divert from Minneapolis to <clears throat> to Cleveland, uh, where you need them. If you're small and you're making for your company, big bets to say, we're gonna go all in on uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland uh, and Cleveland shuts down because of a storm, then <laughs> you, you can't react. So the bigger guys do have an advantage because they have the scale and they have more options. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, again, Tom, something I don't know very much about is, my suspicion is the bigger companies are more likely to attract FTC of interest and therefore the regulators say, you can't collude with your competition. That, that would be, tying up the market and anti uh, anti competitive trade activities right yeah i probably shouldn't say <laughs> anything about that coming from from my industry but uh <laughs> okay it's uh where you can offer the same product and services i don't think any regulator has a problem with that part um okay. it's, it's where you do it to exclude people from the market that it becomes a, a bit of a problem <clears throat> okay well, uh, Dr. Lim, um, what, uh, how would you categorize uh, or how would you uh, describe sort of zero capabilities in terms of a model and what constitutes the highest level of capabilities uh, in terms of, you know, reacting to the supply chain or managing the supply chain um, from your perspective, from an academic perspective? Uh, yeah, basically, the more 
a company is prepared, the more it's capable to handle them. So uh, we mm -hmm. can categorize risks into four groups. There is a supply risk. In other words, are we prepared for the case where there is a shortage in components? There is a process risk. In other words, are we prepared for the case where we have shortages in workers or machines in our factory? And there is a demand risk. In other words, are we pre uh, predicting demand accurately? Are we prepared for the cases where there is a surge in demand? And there is a corporate level risk. In other words, is our company financially stable? Can we monitor all the members in our supply chain? Is everything visible and transparent? So the more we are prepared, the more mature our company is in terms of the supply chain and agility and resilience. So for example, if you compare Chrysler and Ford after 9-11 in 2001, air carriers were having trouble making uh, deliveries right after 9-11. And Chrysler asked their carriers to switch from air to ground transportation but Ford was not able to do the same because, and because of that, they had to shut down five of their US plants and their production volume was reduced by 13% in the fourth quarter of 2001. And this is the case where Ford was not prepared for a supplier risk and uh, obviously Ford had low capability. Well, thank you, Dr. Lim. That was really an interesting example. Uh, it reminds me of the fact that, you know, um, and Tom mentioned earlier that, you know, there were, that if you have, um, uh, uh, if you're moving things around there, I mean, in, in the last couple of years, we've also heard that there's been a massive shortage of drivers, even for trucking and all of that. So I think the labor shortage, which also Dr. Lim mentioned, can be a problem. And also the fact that maybe uh, people are changing the way they buy or they shop. You know, if they're mm -hmm. buying, if they're migrating mainly online. Uh, what happens to the, you know, planning by people who don't have the, the online, you know, thing worked out. So I think it's, it's a lot of different things that you have to juggle. It seems like the supply chain seems to be very important to, you know, top management now. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, some strategies for ensuring supply chain agility and resilience. What can you recommend uh, or what kinds of, um, you know, I, what kinds of uh, approaches are companies taking to change their strategies regarding supply chain and uh, in, to ensure that they are able to recover in case there is a, a massive um, shock to the system or in case, you know, they need to kind of uh, respond to, you know, demand fluctuations or supply shortages, et cetera. So maybe we'll start with you again this time, Duncan. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dr. Simshi Levy at uh, MIT talked about time to survive, time to recover. Um, huh. Oh, TTS, TTR, what was the other one? Anyway, um, those, those are big ones. Um, and so that's, that's one strategy, but certainly I'm a great believer in the digital twin model. So if you can react faster, that buys you time. Um, and if the students have played uh, the beer game, which they might have done, they've probably seen the bullwhip established, partly because the system itself is unstable and partly because people overreact. So there's, if you let the system do the math and tell you what to do, it's probably going to be generally more stable than if you just react on how you feel about it. Um, so. Uh, those things kick in. Um, let's see what else would I say about that. Um, yeah, so, I'm, so the, the digital twin model, if you can predict how the supply chain is going to behave either in an event or in whatever you do to, to react to some event, uh, even if that prediction isn't quite right, if it's uh, directionally right, it's better than not any information at all. And so that can help bring better or faster response and better stability at the same time. So that's, yeah, uh, building up that digital twin. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. <laughs> Hi, Duncan, just for the sake of the students, can you maybe explain a little bit what you mean by digital twin? So for the supply chain, the digital twin would be a computer model of as much of the supply chain as you can get data for. Um, 
And so it knows about all the different levels and all the different parts. So you have um, 300,000 parts be between what you sell and, and, and what you use to, to make the pieces that you sell. And you've got customers, customers and customers and, your, and yourself and your couple of uh, sub-assembly facilities in your operation and suppliers and their suppliers. If you can get all that data in one place, when you see a demand change or you simulate a demand change, the computer does all that logic and figures out, okay, what's the impact on that? So knowing that every, every truck I sell has uh, 20, 23 o -ring, rubber O-rings in it, doesn't mean that if you sell a new truck, you have to buy 23 new O-rings because you've probably got a whole lot of inventory throughout your entire supply chain it might make no difference to your supplier at all, except if you're in a shortage situation, then you sell an extra truck and you've got to find 28 extra O-rings or you won't be able to ship it. Um, so that, that's where, where the value of the, of the digital twin, well, definition, very simplified and the value of it. It gets more complicated if you have multiple suppliers, multiple production facilities for the same thing. But again, the twin can simulate or can estimate how you would normally react in these situations. And again, tell you uh, to Professor Lim's point where your bottleneck would be in that situation. And then you have more time to deal with it. If you can tell in five minutes that you're going to have a problem someplace in your supply chain and get started to work on it, that might save you three months of time that it would have taken previously before you could even start to work on the problem. <clears throat> Mm, thank and you in three so much. Months, you can burn off a lot of supply. <laughs> thank you, Duncan. That was very insightful. Tom? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer it from a different perspective. Yeah. So where does the data come from? <clears throat> so we can do all this modeling. And so what is your source? So what we see going on in the industry is, you know, you can get data direct from the source. Mm -hmm. You can screen scrape. So you can go to various websites if if you have the right reference data and pull in events and try to fill in the bits that are missing. And you can apply predictive analytics to say, well, on average, the move from the terminal to the warehouse is an hour and 15 minutes. We'll just mm -hmm. plug in an hour and 15 minutes. So what Duncan's talking about is once you have this data doing the, the digital twin to do uh, modeling and see which is the best, but also understand in the background of that, that people are, you know, it's not rubber bands, but, you know, people are pulling in data from a lot of different sources mm -hmm. to try and complete the supply chain. And this is where some of the technology comes in, in terms of um, that last mile visibility. So a lot of what is available. So last mile would be the truck from the terminal to the warehouse, not mm -hmm. the final mile from the warehouse to the shelves. But uh, there's been US regulation for driver safety that requires a device inside each truck to monitor the hours uh, a driver is driving mm. to make sure that he's not exceeding the limit and causing accidents. Um, but that is now traceable. So there are companies that are focusing on that device to track it. And now they can see actually with dots on a map exactly where the driver is mm. and when is he going to be at the warehouse. There's also app-based solutions that say the driver downloads my app and I, that allows me to track him and I can also see exactly where he is. So the uh, I talked about filling in the data with screen scraping and predictive analytics, but actually there's also technologies evolving all the time to en enable this visibility to become broader and broader to where you can see a ship on satellite exactly where it is. So this modeling will get better and better and more and more accurate, not just because it's a continuous learning cycle, but because technology is providing more and more data points to enable that. Thank and do you, you find that people are, I'll say systematizing that data collection. So having got that satellite feed of where the ships are once because they really needed it, do they then make that happen automatically all the time? So they know where all their ships are all, all the time or pretty close to where they all are. There's a, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Not, I don't want to go too deep on it, but there's a lot of, you can get it direct from the source, like from the, mm -hmm. the ship carriers, or you can get it from satellite feeds, but there's, with almost all of the data, there's more than one way to get it. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot of data being generated. So the key here is visibility, it seems. So uh, uh, let me move on to Dr. Lim here. Um, uh, so Dr. Lim, are there any, I mean, maybe you can share how you uh, can apply models to ensure supply chain agility and resilience and, and are there some ways to make better predictions under uncertainty, given that we, there are so many things changing all the time? Uh, yeah, uh, so I wanna talk about three uh, models or strategies. The first strategy is pooling, and the second one is postponement, and the third one is chaining. And pooling means uh, using centralized distribution rather than decentralized distribution. Centralized distribution means we are serving several markets in using one uh, factory. For example, Amazon has only a few warehouses in the United States. And these warehouses serve all the customers in the United States. So that's centralized distribution. On the other hand, other retailers have thousands of warehouses and retail stores throughout the United States. And they're using decentralized model. And the centralized model is proven to be more robust in matching demand, especially when demand is highly uncertain. The second one is postponement. Postponement means we postpone some part of our production until after we receive an order. For example, mm -hmm. Benetton is a clothing company and it produces sweaters without dyeing. All the sweaters are white. And once it receives an order with a specific color requirement, it finishes the dyeing part. So they postpone dyeing until or they receive an actual order with a specific color requirement. And this is, this is proven to be more cost effective and time, mm -hmm. time effective and it's more effective when in matching demand when uh, demand is highly unpredictable. And the next one is chaining. Chaining means uh, not relying on a single supplier for a component. So for example, mm -hmm. let's say we are producing cars Instead of having supplier A who can produce tires only and supplier B who can produce wheels only, we should have supplier A who can produce both tires and wheels and supplier B who can produce both tires and wheels. And this will eliminate our dependency on a single supplier for a particular component. So for example, Honda was selling SUVs and small cars. And in 2008, when there was an economic crisis, people switched from SUVs to small cars and Honda's assembly plants were flexible enough to produce both cars. So they were able to meet all customer demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lim, uh, very interesting. Um, now, moving on, it seems like uh, visibility into the supply chain uh, using technology is one of the most important factors for getting a better handle on, you know, disruptions or potential uh, and, and doing some kind of, um, I guess, simulation to find out where things might go wrong allows you to kind of react more uh, quickly and become more agile. But what are some of the challenges and opportunities with using these digital technologies? If maybe you could share those with us, Thomas. Um, there's a lot of data, so I mean, and there's a lot of different technologies, a lot of moving parts. So, uh, what are the check key challenges you see here in implementing them? I, I think the fundamental <laughs> challenge is uh, data is just data unless you're using it to make a different decision. So, mm -hmm. you know, Tradelands, for example, we have 20 million events a week coming into the platform. Mm. It's a it's a lot of data. That can be overwhelming for some customers. Not They're not consuming all 20 million, but for a customer to see their data globally, you know, what does it mean? What, what do they do with it? Um, so what we find is it's, uh, you know, there has to be a kind of a deliberate onboarding process to not only help them technically consume the data, but also to work with them on what we see as best practices, what are other mm -hmm. customers doing with this similar data. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Yeah, I would add to what Tom said is the best plan in the world is worth nothing if you don't execute it. And mm -hmm. 
people tend not to execute what the the optimizer or the computer tells them is the best plan unless they believe it. Well, they understand it and then they believe it. So if they think the computer's made a mistake, they're going to go away. Well, they're going to ignore it altogether or they're going to question and fight it, right? Um, and some people will fight it regardless because they just, they, they think they're going to lose their job if the computer makes all these decisions for them, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think is really the case. But explainability and understandability of, of the results from the computer is really important. And the systems in place, the processes in place so that these actions can actually be executed. I'm thinking of um, an issue in pharmaceuticals and even in uh, semiconductors and chips. There's a lot of um, um, government approvals, regulatory approvals. And so it's fine that you're going to ship aspirin to someplace, but a country like Japan might only ex allow you to import aspirin if it was made in one of three factories. If it was made someplace else, they won't let you bring it in. So you have to know when you ship to Japan that it was made in the right place. But if you're shipping to the States, they, the, the American FDA might be saying, well, we don't have those same requirements. You can take it from anywhere. Well, when filling the order for the states, if they take the supplier that came from the su supplier that only J or that Japan is the only one that Japan will use, when you go to fit, fill the order for Japan, there's nothing left because you just shipped mm. it to a customer in the states. So those both sides of that system have to be in place, and the people oh, have okay. to execute. So if they just grab whatever is closest, they've just killed the ability to deliver the other order, even though the plan had it all taken care of. So, so it sounds like a massive inventory system for the world has to work properly. <laughs> well, for the company anyway, but keeping track of all these things. And so stuff, data that matters has to be attached to mm -hmm. the physical items and the systems have to be in place that people know what to do and are able to do what to do and believe it and, will there, and actually will execute to what they're told to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. Lim? Can you share your thoughts on this too? Oh, no, I, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so many companies um, are seeking to improve their monitoring and reporting capabilities and gaining insight by, by digital twins. And what information systems and emerging technology tools uh, are either in use or being looked at for the future, for implementation in the future? Can you share maybe some you know, um, cutting edge ideas here in, in the uh, in the supply chain world that we're not aware of maybe. Thomas? Yeah. Um, so one thing that's getting a lot of attention is uh, blockchain. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's often said is blockchain a solution in search of a problem? Um, what is the, the real business application of, of blockchain? And so blockchain is, Good where you need immutable records. You need a, you know, a, a very exact trace of exactly who has touched this. So it, it typically mm -hmm. is required um, for uh, regulatory record keeping. So, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also starting to evolve our business applications of blockchain. So for example, with TradeLens, we have a digital bill of lading. So the bill of lading is a document of title in our industry. It it is required in order for a, a buyer to receive the goods from the seller to prove that they have title between their banks, between the container carrier. Typically, this is produced over the course of seven days. It's produced, it's given to the, the seller who gives it to the bank, who gives it to the buyer. Um, so days are lost. It, it, we estimate it's at least $250 a shipment and three or four days saved by doing a blockchain bill of lading, which enables you to just produce it digitally, give it to the bank in under a minute, the bank can transfer it to someone else at destination in another mm -hmm. country in under a minute. So I think this is really the evolving technology or is business use cases mm -hmm. for blockchain in, in terms of speeding up the supply chain, avoiding delays and risks to the supply chain. Um, so I think that's the most innovative things. And secondly, we're starting to see some work with uh, customs authorities who are have the final say of importing cargo into a country. Um, they're being able to have immutable records of what is the real certificate of origin 
what's inside mm -hmm. the container. We need to review this for security purposes. So having blockchain for use cases like that will start to become more and more mm -hmm. prevalent over the next three years. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Tom. Duncan, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I'll be a little bit, a little biased here too, and that is our rapid response software, Canaxis rapid response software, does create a digital twin of your entire supply chain and does help you know sooner, act faster, mm -hmm. um, and also has artificial intelligence built into it to help you make uh, smarter decisions. Um, so these things certainly help. Um, yeah. Thank you. So if you start with the assumption that disruptions are going to occur, how are your companies or your clients uh, adapting their infrastructure to better manage disruptions? Are they, are they actually changing? Are they all adopting these technologies? I, I see it as both. So I see the technology being adopted. So, so the mm -hmm. first ones are the larger ones who can afford the investment in technology. Mm -hmm. I think the smaller companies tend not to be able to make that investment as an early adopter. So they, mm -hmm. they typically look for bringing several solutions together to, to try and bundle it together for them. Um, but also industries react, like I said in the beginning, where you know when it's really, really messy and really, really ugly, some companies just say, okay, give me one person, one company to manage this for me from an end-to-end -end standpoint. Mm -hmm. That'll mm -hmm give me more visibility, more accountability, because there's nothing worse as a large company than someone doing this to you and saying, no, 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 I did my job, but they didn't do their job, right? Mm -hmm. Duncan, you see this all the time, right? So yeah. that, putting uh, nominating one person to be responsible end to end, then it's only one party who's responsible. And I think that's just a business decision we see being taken more and more. Yeah. We also see our, uh, contract manufacturing, like I think, Large scale contract manufacturing, I think, started in the electronics business. Mm -hmm. And that's now got to the point where there's companies that design the product, they run marketing, they run sales. To virtually, they don't touch the product at all. They might during a demonstration or something, but it's all managed by the third party contract manufacturer. The same is happening now in pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So the active uh, drug ingredients and the uh, packaging, all outsourced. And again, as Tom said, I do my piece. Your job is to handle the demand and get make sure it's satisfied and, and get the product out to our customers. Um, I don't see it happening to a large scale yet in the automotive business, but uh, certainly there's a lot of subcontracting. So General Motors doesn't make no, General Motors doesn't make the seats of your cars, for example, but it makes the engines. But maybe uh, Tesla, I suspect, I don't know whether Tesla makes the engines or the electric motors or not um, for their cars. I suspect they don't. Um, they still put, they still run the final assembly, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's evolving. And certainly having somebody who's an expert in managing the supply chain, just because you can design a great product and have a great sales force does not mean you can run a great supply chain. And right. so subcontracting that out or contract manufacturing that out, I think makes a lot of sense. And I think that's probably gonna happen even more. Well, there's probably a lot of third party uh, uh, supply, I mean, third party logistics mm -hmm. uh, companies as well, right? Uh, moving on to uh, Professor Lim, um, how, uh, can you provide an understanding of how different models work under different conditions, uh, ranging from a very stable environment to highly uncertain? Uh, right, so to analyze the level of risk, we can either use quantitative models or quanti qualitative models. Mm -hmm. So for example, to analyze supply risk or corporate risk, we can use qualitative mo models such as market research or focus groups. On the other hand, to forecast demand, we can use qualitative models such as regression or time series analysis. Mm -hmm. Or to identify the bottleneck operation, we can use computer simulations such as SIMU or ARENA. So these mm -hmm. are general ideas, but when things are normal and stable, I recommend using quantitative models 
uh, because they use historical data to identify a pattern and assume that we'll follow the same pattern in the future. But uh, however, uh, when things are uncertain, I recommend using a combination of qualitative and quantitative models because mm -hmm. human in intuition can catch things that a computer cannot catch. So for example, at the beginning of this pandemic, who thought we would, there would be a surge in demand and there will be component shortage in two years? And who mm -hmm. predicted that Russia would invade Ukraine? So these are the mm -hmm. things that human can only catch. So when things are highly uncertain, I recommend a qualitative model. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lim, that was very insightful. Um, anyone else, would Tom or Duncan, would you like to add anything to that? I would uh, just reinforce that statement that uh, you never know where the next disruption is going to come from. Uh, it right. typically, the big ones cannot be predicted. Mm -hmm. Right, so how do you deal with those? Those are, those are. I mean, that must be something that keeps uh, people who are working on supply chains up at night, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it does, so part of it is, you know, the modeling, statistical modeling of this, but part of it is your management operating system as well, that mm -hmm. disruptions are not singular events. They right. are typical events. Okay. So as a management team, you also need to have an operating model that allows you to say, mm -hmm. what, is, what is the crisis this month? And you, mm -hmm. you have regular meetings and who's going to take ownership and who's responsible. So I think if you take that data and bring it up a level to the management team, mm -hmm. what decisions are they going to take? How are they going to react? What are they going to change? Um, connects the, the two together. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And for, yeah. for the really big disruptions... I, I think I said in our pre preparatory call, like an asteroid hits the earth and blows it up. Well, we're not <laughs> going to really be too worried about our supply chain in that situation. So there's really mm -hmm. little point in trying to simulate that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for water and a few critical things, mm -hmm. yes, but most of us, it's not what we're going to worry about. And minor disruptions that happen all the time, you get good at dealing with those regardless. So then you're thinking about that range of stuff in the middle and you can consider okay what if a supplier isn't able to deliver for six months it doesn't matter whether it's because of a strike or the factory burnt down or they had a probably it doesn't matter so much if they had a component shortage or something like that but they weren't able to deliver now there's a scale and scope thing too so if it's well China puts up a trade barrier and, and won't allow any products to be shipped out, for example. I mean, I guess that's a possibility. Um, then it's not just one supplier, it's all your suppliers in China. So now you have, and again, it doesn't matter. It could be an earthquake. It could be a tsunami. Mm -hmm. It could be lots of things would knock out all your suppliers in China or all your suppliers in Japan. Um, so that's something you could consider and then say, okay, if that was to happen, what alternative sources of supply we have? And you really don't need to worry other than the idea that it might happen, exactly what caused the disruption. You just have to worry the impact of, of the disruption is this and the impact of that on my supply chain is whatever it is. And so mm -hmm. you start using those examples to come up with, with situations. I was gonna come back to a previous point too about thinking about disruptions and, and thinking in advance. So I think every company in the world has somebody, some would say they're the worry warts, that are saying, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And they're always, those people are always looking for some budget to pursue, what if this happens? What if that happens? And up until the last few years, many times they are told there's no money in the budget for that, so do something else. Now those people are getting a lot more attention, a lot more budget, so there's more activity. It's not that people didn't, or that some people didn't consider these things as possibilities, is that the rest of the organization chose to ignore that possibility, I think. Right. Well, thank you so much, Duncan. Um, I'm now going to move on to the uh, more uh, student-focused, um, yeah. uh, you know, of immediate interest to them, because I'm sure that our supply chain majors would like to know, uh, supply chain uh, master students would like to know 
uh, what are some potential job opportunities in in when in managing a supply chain? Is there is there such a thing, manager of a supply chain, and and what kinds yeah. of uh, what kinds of um, you know opportunities can they look forward to when they graduate? And for those who don't have, uh, who are not necessarily um, you know taking IT or, or taking any any uh, supply chain courses, um, why should they pay attention to the supply chain? Good. You've mentioned a lot. You've mentioned a lot about you know how yeah. this affects the company. So I'm sure you have a lot to say. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So uh, from from my viewpoint, um, I think you have a lot of choices to make, right? Mm -hmm. So there are companies that specialize in managing supply chains, uh, like a third party logistics provider, like a mm -hmm. Kuna Nagel or someone who has global presence. And they focus on managing many companies and customers' supply chains. Um, there are large manufacturers, a Target, a Walmart, an Amazon, who own the cargo. And within their company, they have supply chain specialists that manage the supply chain and work with vendors and suppliers to, to manage it. And then you've got the companies within a supply chain, a railroad, a shipping company, um, you know, the hard asset owners. So I think the, the opportunities are great and innumerable. And boy, what a great time to be graduating with a supply chain degree because it's uh, now it's really, really important to companies. So uh, I think companies are looking for the skills that you have. Um, I, I I think you should choose and start to drill down on which of these kind of things um, are the most interesting to me. So if you go into a company that owns the assets, you know, there's growth within that. Um, if you, the companies that are managing their supply chains, uh, they offer a lot of diverse opportunities within the company itself. So I think step one is to get in. You've already done the first step. You, you're going to have a, a supply chain background and degree, mm -hmm. and that gets you in the door. And from there, it's about being smart and hardworking. So I think you're all in a very fortunate position. Um, start to think about which of those you would most enjoy. Because if you enjoy it, you'll be able to work hard at it. Yeah. Duncan? Yeah, I would add to what Tom said. First of all, when we talked earlier, I believe, Tom, you did not start in supply chain you kind of fell into it i'll say through the back door i know i did i did mm -hmm. electrical engineering which was related but not supply chain and kind of fell into it um another aspect you didn't mention tom was your company my company developing software so there's computer science there's people who understand supply chain that write the software there's also people who understand supply chain who help customers deploy it um, make sure the software gets used properly teaching them how to use it, understanding their issues, configuring it, all these aspects of it. Um, and so that, what I would call field work is um, if you get excited about watching things being made or watching stuff moving around in a supply chain, you get to visit some world-class companies and talk to the people who are actually doing it. And you get to, to learn from all of them whatever they're doing, which for me has been really exciting over many years now. Um, for those of you who don't have a supply chain background, but have an awareness of it, well, there's also sales. So salespeople, in my view, is largely education. It's teaching the potential customer that there's value in whatever it is that you're selling and that they can take advantage of that value. So you're teaching them what you know about a supply chain and how your product can help them solve that problem in the supply chain. Um, so there's that side of it as well. So there's, yeah, there's lots of areas. Can access, we are hiring. Uh, we won't be able to hire all of you, I don't think, but uh, you look on our website and there's a career section there and uh, <laughs> you can learn from Thank that, you. I guess, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that, Duncan. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Tiger to uh, run the question and answer part of it. Tiger, maybe we can stop recording now and um... Uh, move on to the question and answers. Uh, I'm sure the students have a lot of questions for you, so. Uh, 